Good afternoon, good evening to everybody that has joined us thus far uh, on this Thursday, the 16th of September. Uh, this is Jonathan Weaver. I'm the pastor of Greater Mount Nebo. Dr. African. Weaver, um, yes. your, your video is off. Let's see if we can change that right now. You have a camera on your... Yes, I do. Is there a cover on it? I just pulled the cover back. Well, until I, um, do, 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 okay. Bill and everybody, let's go ahead and proceed and I'll get some technical support to help me so long as people can hear me. Is that true, um, Bill, that everybody can hear me? Yep. So far. All right. Yes. So, yes. I'll look forward to uh, taking care of that in just a moment. But in the meantime, Welcome to everybody that has joined us this afternoon. My name is Jonathan Weaver. I'm the pastor of Greater Mount Nebo African Methodist Episcopal Church in Bowie, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., uh, but also uh, the founder and president of an organization called the Pan-African Collective. Our purpose is to heighten awareness among people here in the United States with the people of Africa but also to help bring people together. Uh, if it sounds somewhat familiar to the constituency for Africa, I'm not shocked or surprised by that since I've known Mel Foote, who's with us, of course, this afternoon, this evening as well. And so this is really a joint effort. And I wanna say thank you so much, Mel, for this opportunity for helping to pull all of this together. You have been such a stalwart when it comes to African related issues and how it affects those of us here in America, and particularly within the Black community. I just want to again say thank you so much for everybody that has joined us under this forum title of Strengthening the Engagement Between the Black Faith Community and the People of Africa. We've got a lot that we need to do. I'm so grateful for those of you that are on the line because you have been representatives of members of the Black Faith Community here in the United States that fully understand the importance of connecting with the people of Africa. But we're also grateful for colleagues that are there on the ground on the continent this evening for them from Angola and also South Africa and hopefully also from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to our moderator who will uh, handle the rest of this this evening. We also have Janine Scott, who is the chairperson for the Constituency for Africa uh, Board. And so we're grateful and for others that have joined us as well. So Dr. Uh, Lakeisha Harrison, uh, whom I just gotten to know these last uh, week or so, but my goodness, our bonds are getting stronger and stronger as each day goes by. And so uh, Reverend Dr. Lakeisha Harrison, PhD, Director of the Christ African Theological Institute of Covenant Baptist United Church of Christ, I am turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Weaver. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. Thank you to uh, Mel Foote and the Constituency for Africa for creating a space for the faith community to engage on active policy on Africa. That is not something that policymakers focused on Africa generally tend to do. Um, but indeed, I am thankful that Constituency for Africa recognizes that the faith community is as engaged with policy, development, security, et cetera, as any other sector is when it comes to the continent of Africa. And so our conversation today with our esteemed panelists is going to focus on just that. We're going to focus on policy. What we as a panel have agreed to talk about is solutions moving forward. But that begs the question, what is the problem? I think it goes without saying for most people that we recognize there is often a disconnect between the African continent and the greater diaspora, particularly here in the United States, and an even greater disconnect often when it comes to issues of faith. And so we know what that problem is. 
And there's no need to belabor that point and dig deep into it. So what we would like to do as a panel today is to focus on potential solutions that we can each bring to bear in order to forge a path forward for how we can engage and provide our own contributions as a faith community to development and policy for the African continent from the U.S. and global perspective. And so we have a very esteemed group of panelists here today, and we are going to move forward with our conversation today for our guests who are on the line. Um, our agenda today is we're going to kind of hopscotch uh, through our speakers. Um, in the interest of time, I am going to introduce speakers uh, two, three, and four at a time. Uh, in between so that you don't lose interest so that we so that we keep going um, but you don't forget what I said about who a speaker is and what their background is um, in between as we go through speaking from one to the next. So allow me to introduce our first speakers. First we're going to hear from Ambassador Karfala Yansene, um, the current ambassador from Guinea. Now, he has served for over 30 years in different positions in the government of Guinea, from the Central Bank Governor to Minister of Economy and Finance and Minister of Mining and Geology. And from January 2016 to January 2018, Dr. Yansene served as Senior Minister Advisor to the President of the Republic of Guinea for International Financial Institutions and at the 2017 G20 Summit. He served as the Sherpa for Guinea's president, who was then the chairman of the African Union. The ambassador was associated with a number of regional and international boards and technical committees, including, among others, the vice chair of the board of directors of the African Economic Research Consortium, the executive board of the African Capacity Building Foundation, a member of the United Nations Committee for Development Policy, and is responsible for graduation criteria of the least developed countries. So let us all please welcome Ambassador Yansene. Following his opening remarks, we will hear from Reverend Dr. David Goatley, who is the Associate Dean for Academic and Vocational Formation, the Ruth W. and A. Morris Williams Jr. Research Professor of Theology and Christian Ministry, and Director of Office of Black Church Studies at Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. He is a former urban missionary, denominational leader, pastor, and theological education. Reverend Goatley served as the executive secretary treasurer for Lot Carey Baptist Foreign Mission Society for over two decades prior to joining Duke Divinity School. He serves in leadership capacities with the NAACP, the Lot Carey Baptist Foreign Mission Society, the Baptist World Alliance, and the World Council of Churches. So Ambassador Yansene is going to open us up and start with stating the occasion. And then Reverend Dr. Goatley, we would appreciate it if you would take us into an understanding of what current missionary work looks like when it comes to Africa, as opposed to what we historically think of as missionary work on the continent of Africa. Ambassador Yansene, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh... Madam, um, I'm honored and uh, it is a pleasure for me to uh, be invited to this important meeting concerning the strengthening of the engagement between the Black faith community and the people of Africa. At the onset, I would like to say that uh, I'm not part of any faith community. Uh, I believe in God, but um, <clears throat> I'm not part of the faith community. But uh, it's uh, an honor for me to uh, um, say some words about uh, this engagement. Um, I would like to recall that um, almost two years ago, I was invited by my brother, um, Jonathan Weather to participate in the breakfast prayer and to deliver a speech on almost the same topic. My main message was then the following. The people of Africa were victim of European countries 
through slavery and colonialism. As a result, the development trajectory of the continent was derailed. And the African peoples were separated for centuries by the Atlantic Ocean without any connection at all. This situation started to change when African territories got independence from European colonial powers. Today, I may say that there is growing awareness that both African people living on the continent and Black people living in the Americas have a common destiny. People of African descent, I believe, will never be respected as long as the African continent will be perceived as a continent of poverty and despair. Hence the need to join our forces, our energies, our imagination to turn around the African continent into a safe and purpose place. The journey may be very difficult, may be long with conflict, hunger, epidemics, but the objective is achievable if we are all determined to work together. In this respect, I believe that the Black faith community has an important role to play, particularly with respect among others, to one, engaging with the faith communities in Africa in view to familiarize themselves with the African reality. The African ambassadors stand ready to facilitate this cooperation. Two, to educating the young black people in the US about the cultural values of the Mother continent. And three, to eventually restoring the dignity of the black women and men in the US. Africa was actually the cradle of humankind and Africa will, became, will become the continent of the future. Thanks to its great economic potential and especially to its demographic power. As Africa will have the youngest population in the world in the next 50 years. 20 years ago, I participated in a study sponsored by the World Bank and African Development Bank. The title of the study was, Can Africa Claim the 21st Century? Ladies and gentlemen, dear sisters and brothers, my answer is yes. The second part of the 21st century will be the century of Africa. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Yansane, and uh, thank you for to Dr. Weaver and uh, to our um, partners uh, for this invitation. Um, so I'm going to speak briefly to um, what can be done uh, as examples for contemporary missional engagement. Uh, on the continent. And so there have been historic ex um, experiences, uh, very heavy handed uh, colonial expressions, imperialistic expressions, where people from the West, uh, irrespective of uh, ethnicity, uh, have imposed their wills on uh, partners on the continent. I think a 21st century model of uh, missional engagement on the continent uh, would look something like this. A prioritization of supporting indigenously led communities engaged primarily in ministries of evangelism, compassion, empowerment, and advocacy. Again, the emphasis is on uh, providing support 
to come alongside, to partner, and to support the vision and the priorities of indigenously led communities, which means that uh, we in North America would not um, imagine being able to come and impose our will. This is what I want to do, or this is what I think we should do. Let me give you an example. Uh, I was working with uh, a, a, a group who had a bright idea that they were going to send blankets uh, to a partner in the global south because they had been doing a project similar to that in North America. And when they mentioned to me about them trying to work out the logistics, my question was, who asked for blankets? And it was a very important question for them because they had not asked their partners about what they needed. They proposed what they thought the partners should have. And so I think a 21st century model for engaging in Africa is to support indigenously led ministries. Now, for those of us who are Christians, I would uh, propose that these four examples are very reasonable approaches. Evangelism, which as we would describe it, means holistic evangelism. It doesn't mean something that is conceptual and bracketed in a spiritual way. It means ministries of compassion, that people need the gentle care and caress and support of a cup of cool water. It means ministries of empowerment to find places where people have been disempowered and to come alongside to help build the capacity to live lives of security and dignity. And then advocacy. We need people to help to uh, interpret and to challenge the systems of oppression that come uh, and force people into lives of insecurity and indignity. Next, I'd like to say that uh, practically what to do is to find prospective partners who have their, uh, your possible size and capacity to deliver on what you feel the Lord is calling you to do. If you have imagination of doing a large scale agricultural project, for example, you wouldn't want to try to find uh, a community that has no access to land because you'll be frustrated and they'll be frustrated. So as you're imagining what the Lord is calling you to do, we need to find prospective partners who have compatible capacity for delivering on what we're called to do. When you find those partners, then you engage in conversation for listening uh, so that we can uh, negotiate together the substance and scale and scope. And then finally, you need to uh, uh, secure partners who can help you with the kind of financial compliance as well as technical support that you would need. There are uh, financial reporting obligations if you're sending more than $10,000 out of the country. And so there are uh, compliance issues with the US Department of Treasury, for example. So those are the things that I would propose that we do to focus on supporting indigenously led communities engaged in ministries of evangelism, compassion, empowerment, and advocacy. Commit to a multi-year time frame. Find partners of appropriate size and capacity. Collaborate so that you can support with substance and scale what your partners want. And then secure partners who can help you with the financial and technical support. I think following these uh, general guidelines will help us to do good and faithful work that honors God and recognizes the dignity and humanity of our partners. Thanks. Thank you so much for those words. Thank you, Ambassador Yansene, for setting the tone for our conversation today. And thank you, um, 
uh, for also then following that up with an understanding of very clear and specific set of tasks for how we can go about engaging in modern 21st century missionary work as those on the ground or those in the diaspora seeking to engage in issues on the African continent from a faith-based perspective. Now we're going to move on to our next three set of speakers. We have Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith. She is the Senior Associate for Pan-African and Orthodox Church Engagement, and she is directly involved on the ground with Bread for the World, working on issues directly in multiple African communities. And so she brings to bear uh, in this conversation on the ground work uh, directly related to what our last speaker just mentioned about what the people need. Following her, we will hear from Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond. She is co-pastor of Bethel AME Church in Boston and the Swartz Resident Practitioner in Ministry Studies at Harvard Divinity School. And from 2001 to 2003, she traveled to South Sudan to participate in an elaborate quote-unquote underground railroad to facilitate the freedom of more than 10,000 people enslaved in Northern Sudan during the Civil War. And this experience prompted her and five other women to co-found My Sister's Keeper. It is a humanitarian and human rights organization that champions social justice for women and girls in conflict zones. And she also serves as the director of women ministries at her church and was appointed Swartz resident practitioner of ministries in 2015. And immediately following uh, Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond, we will hear from Reverend Dr. Ray Hammond. And he is also co-pastor of uh, of Bethel AME Church in Boston. And he has a long history of involvement, not just with Africa, but also with youth and community activities. He's a chairman and co-founder of the 10 Point Coalition. It is an ecumenical group of Christian clergy and lay leaders working to mobilize in the greater Boston community around at-risk youth. He is the board chair of Bethel's Generation Excel program, executive committee, a uh, committee member of the Black Ministerial Alliance, chair of the Boston Opportunity Agenda of the Roxbury Community College Foundation, and a member of the strategy team for the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. And he is also a member of the Boston Green Ribbon Commission, a trustee of the Yawkey Foundation, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and the Math and Technology Public Charter High School. He is a former chairman of the Boston Foundation, and he continues to work with you on activities in the AME Church. So welcome our next three speakers, Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith, you have the floor. You are on mute. Uh, please unmute. Thank you. And thank you for catching that, Dr. Harris. To you and to the esteemed panelists and all of the distinguished guests, I have four recommendations I'd like to offer. I know I have all of six minutes, so I'll try to be very quick so that others can come. So the four recommendations I want to offer begin with faith-based advocacy. Happily, my colleague, uh, Dr. Goatley, has mentioned some of this. But at Bread for the World, we are policy driven. Uh, we advocate for uh, the end of hunger and poverty from a, and for me, from a Pan-African lens and Orthodox lens uh, with the US Congress, as well as the Office of the President and government agencies. And there are issues that we have identified in this moment that I think have Pan-African and if you will, the, the wider global community interests. One would be economic justice in the faith-based advocacy perspective. Here we're reminded that in Acts, for example, the Christian tradition, sharing things in common, economic justice, food access and equity. Here we see in Matthew 5, the hunger uh, for righteousness. It's not just hunger, but it's for righteousness. And so food access and inequities and food deserts, we know, uh, are needing advocacy in the public policy space. When I say public policy, not only on the Hill, 
but globally, locally, and nationally. We need to be connected with policymakers and be policymakers who grow new leadership. Uh, global nutrition, uh, our bodies are temples of God. And so what we do with our bodies matter. And so advocacy so that we are advancing policies that are about not just hunger, but nutrition. And then climate justice. We all are called to be stewards of the God's earth. The, uh, in the biblical traditions, we know this is clear. And climate justice means we take agency to advocate so that we have more equity in the ways in which we use God's earth. And the racial and gender equity, we know about the Amarjo Day, uh, all being made in the image of God. And so the whole issues around equity matter when we come to the discussion of Af Africans and people of African descent, particularly. And then land rights and farming, uh, stewardship again of God's earth. Uh, we share this issue of land rights and unfortunately land grabbing that has taken away our rights on those issues and the ability to farm. Unfortunately, less than 1% of people of African descent in the U.S. space own farm land, own land. And this is obviously unacceptable and has just diminished uh, since the early 1900s. My second point would be uh, relationship building with love. Relationship building with love. There's relationship building of tolerance and respect, but in the faith community, building up relationship building with love. There's a great diversity within our Pan-African community. We don't know each other the way we should because of colonialism that Dr. Goatley mentioned and other structures that have mitigated against our unity and our community. And so this relationship building with love, this is a key recommendation. Uh, and we can do this in our faith places from churches and mosques and synagogues and other places of faith. These are key places for us to do that. And then in our schools, we need to decolonize knowledge. Unfortunately, our stories are not told in basic educational processes. And we need to be advocates to tell our stories of Pan-African heritage and to let our children know that they matter and that it is agreeable in the normalization of educational processes. So the whole process of decolonizing knowledge. And then the cultural engagements. We have festivals, we have celebrations, we need to ensure that we're inviting each other in our communities. There isn't a place in the world where the diaspora and people of the African continent in the first and second generation don't exist. We need to be invitational to each other. This community uh, invites a relationship building and with love. My third recommendation has to do with the global space for mutual engagement. Happily, we are living in a time when the African Union has now uh, adopted a sixth union to which we belong in the, uh, from African descent with our brothers and sisters on the continent. And all of us need to read the 2063, the 2063 uh, Pan-African uh, uh, Pan uh, Pan uh, um, uh, directives uh, for 2063, where partnerships are encouraged. And then the UN Decade in Solidarity with People of African Descent, where faith community partnerships are invited. Happily, just last month, just last month, the UN Assembly adopted the new permanent form of people of African descent. And I'm honored to be on that working group that's going to be a part of launching this new initiative for next year. And then visitations and living in each other's community. Many of us have had the privilege of visiting different places within the diaspora, as well as on the continent. This is critical to our learning and in the global space of mutual engagement. And then finally, my last recommendation has to do with human rights. Human rights is a critical issue and it is a faith issue. Many of us in the United States know about the civil rights movement, which was an expression of the human rights that all of us are, um, are a part of and should be a part of. And the advancing of democratic principles within our communities, inclusive principles of all within the diversity of our communities. And then certainly last but not least, to be prepared to make the legal arguments as well as the moral arguments around our being uh, in the equitable space of our humanity with all of God's people. So those would be the four recommendations that I would offer with the subsets identified. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much.
Reverend White Hammond, it, uh, feel free to move and uh, to have the floor. Yes, Dr. Uh, White Hammond, you have the floor. Uh, if you can hear us, please unmute uh, and turn on your camera. I know you're with us because you were with us earlier. So if you're still here, um, please join us on the floor. Dr. Harrison, I'm not quite sure what happened, but I just got a text to her saying she cannot get in. I just forwarded to her the link again. So perhaps she'll be able to join us, but maybe we need to uh, move on to the next person. Yeah, um, the, Dr. Hammond was online. I'm no longer seeing uh, Dr. Hammond here. I just sent the confirmation email again. Okay, thank you, Bill. Well, no problem. And uh, for all of us who are joined together on the line, our panelists are joining us from all over the world. And so we have different connectivity issues uh, around the world, but one of the things we know that we do as an African community when we come together, particularly in the faith community, is we give each other grace and understanding. And so we will welcome the Hammonds back when they are able to join us. And we are now going to move to uh, Bishop Seth Larty as our next speaker, and we'll come back to the Hammonds as soon as we have an opportunity to do so. Uh, so next we will hear from uh, the Right Reverend Dr. Seth Larty. He was elected the 100th Bishop in line of succession in July 2012 in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. His first assignment was the Western West Africa Episcopal District, and he has historically become the first African Native Bishop to serve as an Episcopal to serve an Episcopal area in the United States of America in the assignment of the Alabama, Florida Episcopal District. And he currently serves as the presiding bishop of the Central Southern Africa Episcopal District. He serves as chairperson of Zion's Benefit Services and first vice president of church growth and development in the AME Zion Church. Bishop Larty has served in the following capacities in the AME Zion Church as Episcopal Director of what is currently known as the Eastern North Carolina Episcopal District and the Piedmont Episcopal District. He is the founder and former of President of the Green County Education and Enrichment Program, Snow Hill, North Carolina, the Educational Acceleration and Enrichment Program, Inc., Elizabethtown, North Carolina, the Goler Institute of Development and Education, Inc. in the Goler Community Development Corporation of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Bishop Larty, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Let me truly express my gratitude and thanks to uh, Dr. Melford and uh, certainly Dr. Weaver and acknowledge all of the distinguished uh, panels, panelists here this afternoon. I want to just uh, take the moment to express my gratitude to Dr. Melford for this engaging conversation. Uh, I want to talk about the Transatlantic People Ministry. Uh, the Transatlantic People Ministry is a program of the 400 Year Celebration Inc. The 400 Celebration uh, Inc. has been established uh, specifically to celebrate the accomplishments of persons of African origin from 1619 to 2019 and beyond. Uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Williams Lottis serves as Vice President and the Reverend Dr. Kathy Thomas McFadden as the Executive Director. I want to point out that most major denominations in America have mission work on the African continent. On the other hand, there are some 5 million Africans in America. 
Uh, you have some 2 million that were born here and 3 million plus who are immigrants. Those numbers could change depending upon what census you're looking at. Uh, the sad story here, my sisters and brothers, uh, is that there is very little uh, intentional interaction between Africans who are here and the black church. When you think about other nationalities that come to this country, there is a structured, well-organized home away from home that facilitates the assimilation into this culture. When it comes to persons coming from Africa, it is a very difficult and different story. Usually, usually, when you have persons coming from Africa, coming to America, they either come into school, and sometimes the school that they come to do not have any real uh, plan for them when it comes time for holidays and other uh, uh, important times in the school's life. These students are left to remain on the campus, live in the dormitories, and fend for themselves. When others come, they come sometimes to families. And as you know, family, uh, when you come, the first day is okay, the second day, wonderful. After a week, we start wondering how long you're gonna be here. And after 90 days, you are truly a problem even for your own family members that you came to visit. Why? Because the culture in Africa and that up here, they are completely diametrically opposite. Over there, you could stay with a family member for your lifetime. You can't do it here because you're talking extra telephone bill, extra water bill, extra food, extra internet, extra everything. And there is no extra money coming in, so you have a problem. So when we see these kinds of situations, we realize that Africans coming over to this country, life could be a lot better. But at this moment, it's difficult. And this is the reason why we are proposing the Transatlantic People Ministry. It is designed to connect people from Africa with established congregations in America. These congregations in America can provide welcome events for persons coming from Africa into the community. These congregations can provide community centers where education, orientation to this culture can occur uh, in a place of mutual fellowship. These congregations can provide a space for worship, Bible studies, and significant events such as weddings, funerals, and baptism. There's some benefits. The strengthening and expansion of the mission is so crucial. Imagine if you have 5 million Africans here and each of these come from communities in Africa. If you have a local church here, that is working in a community in Africa, there is a very high probability that those persons in that community will come to that particular church. Why? Because you are working with members of their community in their hometown. And so this transatlantic uh, people's program is a way by which mission work that is being done by black churches in Africa I'm not sure what happened. Well, we lost uh, Bishop Larte there uh, really quickly, um, but I believe he was wrapping up his comments. Um, so uh, we will have him uh, come back when it is time for a Q&A. And if he had any conflicts, uh, uh, comments that um, he was unable to get to in his closing remarks, he can uh, let us know what those are at that time. And so now I do believe that Gloria is back with us. 
uh, Reverend Dr. White Hammond. I introduced you a little while ago, and if you are ready to come on camera and unmute your mic, please do so. Uh, you are welcome to have the floor at this time. I'm not sure if a uh, co-pastor is there with you and available, but if so, then he is also welcome to have the floor immediately following you. If you need a few more moments, please just put a note in the chat and we can go on to our next speaker as you uh, uh, prepare yourself to speak if you need a little bit more time. But we thank you, Bishop Larte, uh, for those comments. Um, we appreciate them. I see you're on camera. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Have the floor. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate your patience. We, uh, uh, as you might have heard, just arrived in in Iceland, and uh, so we are still trying to find our way and, and do the Wi-Fi. So again, thank you so much. Uh, I've, I've got thrown off a little bit, so I didn't get, get to hear all of the prior conversation, but I, I certainly want to thank you all for this invitation uh, to participate in a conversation that is uh, so important to me. I did get to hear a little bit of your excellency. I want to acknowledge uh, my good friend, John Weaver, whom we have known way back um, since our college and graduate school days, which I would say that that was about 20 years ago, but you all would know better than that. And, um, and again, uh, the ambassador, thank you so much. I just want to share a little bit about how, uh, why this subject is so important to me and how I've engaged at least some of the things that I've learned along the way. My husband is actually on another call, so it looks like I'm going to be pitch hitting for both of us. My first trip to the continent was actually in the, um, in the early 90s when uh, my husband and I were invited by the people who identify as our parents in ministry, Bishop John and Reverend Cecilia Bryant to support a, a, um, a, a medical clinic for individuals, uh, uh, Liberians who were displaced uh, in Cote d'Ivoire during the, the war there. And by way of background, my husband and I are, are both physicians and, uh, and also ministers. And so we, that was our first trip. And I remember meeting some of the Liberian refugees. And one of the comments that they said that was most poignant to me, there was a, a, a woman who is a member actually of an AME church, a lifelong member. And she said that what um, she was so happy to see my husband and me at the clinic. She said that in the midst of their war that the, the white Jehovah's Witnesses came, the white Catholics came, uh, and where were the African Americans uh, who were um, uh, who were their descendants, and uh, and for so many years had uh, had benefited for their engagement in our black churches, and that was a very poignant statement for me, and one that helped me to appreciate that this is not. Uh, that this kind of engagement, that this conversation, this work um, uh, across the, the waters is not just an opportunity, it's, it's actually a responsibility. So several years later, I was invited to participate uh, with a colleague in a, a fact-finding mission. She was a, a reporter for one of the Boston um, uh, television stations here. And at that time, looking at the conflict in South Sudan between the Northern based government and Southerners, and especially looking at uh, the extent to which people were enslaved as a result of that conflict. Uh, had, again, going there, hearing uh, people, having conversations, appreciated the, the importance of engaging again uh, as a responsibility. And subsequently, I formed a group, there were several of us, African-American Christian women, who formed a group called My Sister's Keeper. And we uh, initially were doing work in terms of advocacy, just, uh, just raising awareness about the, the genocide in Southern Sudan. And then uh, and get working with uh, women, South Sudanese women who identified projects that they wanted to start and uh, drive. And we raised funds and provided support for them to do that, uh, income generating projects. And then subsequently we uh, worked with them to build a school and a, um, a literacy project. 
and continued to do that until about 2006 when Darfur erupted and more and more people were being coming involved in Darfur. I, that's how I got to know David Goatley. That's how I heard of the legendary Mel Foote. And, um, and so realized that it wasn't, again, it wasn't just the, the importance of going and doing and supporting, but there was there are also policy implications. And at that point, I became involved with the Save Darfur movement and very much involved in, again, letting people know, but also uh, engaging with our government around how, uh, what the policies would be with regard to that conflict. And subsequently, we've all followed the work in South Sudan and the important work that's gone on there. I haven't um, and so it's been about five years since I've, that's been a robust part of my work, but I continue to support. I'd say the things that I've learned is uh, that, that there, there it, again, it's not just an opportunity, there's a responsibility for us to collaborate. And I, I have um, appreciated that so often the way that people have approached um, issues in Africa is for uh, Americans to come and share what they say are the best practices. And, uh, and, and so we're telling people what to do. I've appreciated that people, uh, what individuals need for us to do is to trust them to know what needs to be done and then to come alongside and, and uh, support that work. Uh, I think that um, uh, what the gentleman spoke about before, the, uh, the, the at least one critical strategy is for congregations in America to partner congregations uh, on the continent uh, around a number of different issues. It uh, not only provides a way for people to, to develop relationships, but also to distribute resources. And again, continue the work of advocacy, both on the local and, um, and the, the national level uh, with regard to, to how our country uh, interacts with, um, with countries and, and on the continent and how uh, we can be more supportive of those efforts. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, and I see a, a through line so far from all of our speakers and uh, foremost through line I see and hear is to allow the people of the continent to speak for themselves and to define for themselves what it is they need and to provide support for them in the issues they have identified that they need and that they would like us to partner with. And so now we're going to move on to our uh, organizer of this panel, uh, Pastor Jonathan Weaver, and he introduced himself earlier. So there's no need for me to reiterate or restate um, his esteemed background. I thank him as the rest of the panelists uh, do as well for allowing us all the opportunity to participate in this conversation. And so uh, Pastor Weaver, Following up on comments um, from Bishop Larte and this issue of the disconnect between African-American congregations and African immigrants here in the U.S., um, I think we know that one of the challenges in that regard is denominational differences between uh, denominations people on the African continent may otherwise have uh, traditionally been uh, accustomed to versus those here in the United States. What are some possibilities for how we can bridge some of those gaps in order to break down these um, false barriers that seem to divide us? You have the floor. Dr. Harrison, first of all, thank you so much and thank you for moderating today. Uh, when it comes to that issue of uh, denominationalism and where each denomination may have its own form of worship, uh, maybe some nuances when it comes to uh, uh, how to worship and doctrine. I think that if we look at what is common amongst us, and that is, in fact, of course, the fact that we are all of African ancestry, and therefore look at what binds us together, what unifies us. And so even through the model that we've been using with the Pan-African Collective, that's precisely what we've done 
is to make as a large part of our objective, our goals, is to bring people together within the context of Pan-Africanism. So whether you happen to be Church of God in Christ, AME, AME Zion, Baptist, Presbyterian, that's all well and good. But when you come to our meetings, which are held on the third Saturday of each month, the focus, the goal is what do we have in common? What can we share? And how can we exchange ideas for the better good of the people of Africa? Having said that, I'd like to be able to at least offer some suggestions as to how we can make sure that we continue to not allow denominationalism be a barrier and what we can do to foster stronger relationships between the, the people of Africa and ourselves here in America. One of the things that may sound very simple, but so true, and that is notwithstanding the current situation with the pandemic, but certainly we need to try to find ways to visit Africa. Now, having said that, one of the things that many of us can do is without even having to get on a plane is to still visit Africa. How? By going to an ambassador and to an embassy to be able to see people like Ambassador Yansane and our brother from Malawi, who will be speaking a little bit later. And for those of us in the Washington metropolitan area, I can attest to the fact that it's quite easy to be able to make those kinds of relationships, to be able to go to the embassy, to be able to have maybe the cultural attache or the ambassador, him or herself, to be able to give us a presentation. And therefore, that can already begin to generate some enthusiasm. Now, a second way to do that without traveling uh, literally to Africa at the very beginning is perhaps through connections that could be made by the ambassadors is to then be able to engage in some personal Zoom contacts. But I would also say that outside of the pandemic, being able to invite uh, people like uh, our ambassadors with us at a worship service on a Sunday morning and perhaps have it to be around the time of that country's independence and giving the ambassador an opportunity to talk about the goals, the objectives, the aspirations of the people of that respective country. I dare say that in many instances, we have sitting in those chairs, those pews uh, outside of the pandemic, people that may be agricultural experts, people that uh, are able to serve as doctors and nurses. And it could very well be that after an ambassador has had an opportunity to speak from that pulpit about the dreams and the aspirations and concerns, someone may come up to that ambassador after the service is over and to say, I'd love uh, uh, ambassador to be able to go to Malawi. Here's my card. I'd love to be able to follow up with you and talk more about it. Once individuals go, quite frankly, owing to my own experience when I went a year, years ago through an organization that Angelique is very familiar with called Operation Crossroads Africa. Indeed, he said, uh, the founder, that while you may leave Africa, Africa will never leave you. And so I think that one of the other things that we can do here in America is to connect with local colleges and universities and get to know the student African student population and invite them to come to our churches. Let me also say that in a very tangible way, uh, as Bishop Larte referenced earlier, we ought to be looking at how we can con uh, connect with African-based non-governmental organizations. Well, in this instance, we created a chapter of the Pan-African Collective there in Rwanda as our first start. And I believe that our legal representative, Mukunama Deo Clemence, may still be on the line, but she, through the board there, determined how we can best respond to needs and concerns. And so we responded to the humanitarian crisis after the earthquakes in May of this year. We also did the same thing in Congo. We've also helped to establish a school there in Goma. And finally, let me just say that we also want to make sure that we are spending time listening to our friends on the continent and so that we can collectively, that we can indeed partner with them. That seems to be a refrain over and over again, but I do believe 
that that's what we can do. And indeed, knock down the walls of denominationalism and see how we can best work together to indeed make a difference in the lives of our brothers and sisters on the comment on the continent. One last thing I would mention, and that is, as you get to know people, it may very well be that, for example, if there are council of Christian churches in just about uh, many African nations who have already reached out saying that they are very interested in finding ways of supporting uh, work and identifying people within the Black community that could help in the areas of health care and education. And so there's many opportunities, and I hope that we will avail ourselves of serving as ambassadors and telling our friends about this so that more churches within the faith community, Black faith community, will indeed become more engaged with Africa. Thank you so much, Pastor Weaver. And uh, your comments were very specific and clear about things that all of us can do, whether we are pastors, ministers, or not. Uh, those, uh, those who are attending here today who are members of congregations but might not be leaders of congregations can take these ideas back to the leadership in your churches. And these are concrete, easy things that you can do to begin working on breaking down these divisions between um, the Black American church and Africans on the ground and Africans here in America. To that end, we are now going to go to Evangelist Steve Panza, who is of the Baptist community of Congo, Kinshasa, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And one of the things that he has to contribute to this conversation is his own experience as an African immigrant here in the United States along with his children and how they worked through developing relationships and engaging with the African community here in the U.S. and the African American and greater diaspora community here in the United States. Uh, Evangelist Panza, you have the floor. Please unmute and come on screen. Eventually. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, but we cannot see you yet. If you're unable to come on camera, please just let us know. Uh, well, the camera has got an issue. I don't know why, but it's not, it's not. Uh, That's fine, no worries. We won't worry about it. Please go ahead. We are anxious to hear from you. Okay, thank you uh, for the organizers of uh, this dialogue. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the few things that I have learned. Uh, I am not an immigrant as such, but uh, my children uh, left Congo about uh, eight, seven and six years because there are three of them and uh, we had the opportunity to find out how to host people of Africa by African-Americans in the US. Uh, I was more interested from the beginning to talk about strengthening, of course, the engagement between the black faith um, community. I would say that to assist or to help each other, we must understand the issues of Africans arriving in the USA. Not talking of my children only or specifically, I would say that some of them visit the U.S. for studies, cultural um, exchange, immigration, asylum, political issues, or many other unknown reasons. So African-Americans must know the people of Africa issues and their background if they really want to engage in a sustainable actions. The essential characteristics of African traditional religion like the concept of God, concept of human being, the fear of syncretism, divinities, uh, salvation in African confession, Islam and Christianity, the liberation um, theology like uh, apartheid in, um, in South Africa, ecumenical and evangelical uh, associations. The other issue I want to say is that black issues in the West 
when the black people go to the West, it may be America as a focus now, but in the Western world, we have this background of slavery and Christianity slave, slaves finding comfort in biblical messages or um, spiritual equality and deliverance from salvation, from slavery. We have other issues like when they, they, they move to the Western countries and particularly in America, they will face those movements like lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer movement in Western countries, even promoted in the church. We have also to face those kind of marriage issues like polygamies, serial marriages, divorce, gay marriages, etc. We have tribalism or racism, violence against black people, black people life matters movement, you know it very well. Peace and poverty and violences of human rights while the church is watching and is mute, the youth issues. Uh, if we want a sincere dialogue to help those who migrate or those who visit the US, especially the blacks or the Africans, the dialogue must turn around some of the topics like Africans and the Western missionaries, what is the story? Prosperity theology, which is proclaimed in the Western messages, polygamy and serial marriages, divorce and remarriage, what is the position of the church? What is the congregation saying about? Democracy and uh, justice badly needed in Africa, peace and poverty and violence of human rights, as we said, where the church is silent. And as we know, where there is no peace, genuine dialogue cannot take place. So I'm here to plead for an African and African-American organization or an African-American bridge as a solution for a better integration. Uh, esteemed panelists who have started talking right before me have almost gathered all the most points I wanted to explain because uh, the issue is that they've talked about almost the same things. But let me say the few that I can that um, Africans arriving in the US for various purposes may benefit from an induction regarding their studies, how to apply for a job, where to get social assistance, how to do the business, of course, in compliance with the, the laws of the country. Some only get introduced to churches to attend or to serve the Lord, but not in many other areas they need. A platform or an organization to host them or provide them with holistic information, which means information that take into account all the aspects of the life of people who are immigrants, who are newcomers, who are lost with the culture, with the conflict of generations and many other issues. Many Africans, as an example, I can say, when they get to the US, they, they, they are lost in many areas, like uh, the diet, their belief, their faith, marriage, as for the diet, they put up excess weight, ending with different types of diseases like glycemia, blood pressure issues. They attend churches or they like to attend churches with great, um, I would say, uh, um, fame, which, is, uh, which are well known, where prosperity theology is the best message. They get um, married to Americans whose cultures culture and family life differ in many, many aspects. Then polygamy and serial marriages in the West bring sad and irreparable damages as consequences. Other lo other, others lose their ties with Africa, thinking that once in America, this is all they need. African-Americans must encourage Africans who graduate from the US renowned universities to return to their native countries or to other African countries where the expertise is needed or searched. They need to be 
encouraged, they need to be oriented on how to do that as they are facing many other issues like residents and, and work permits or whatsoever. Hosting welcome events, opening book, a book to register newcomers or actions, I would recommend, though my, uh, the, pre, the, 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 the precedents have already spoke about it. So do more than the embassies. I heard the Reverend Weaver um, mention this about the ambassadors or the embassies, what they can do to give information. But you can also liaise with people like us who are in Africa, but who have got connections with America on almost a daily basis. We can inform, we can encourage, we can direct, we can help assist with visas and all those other issues if needed. Thank you uh, so much, Evangelist uh, Panza. Um, I, I appreciate how you were able to bring uh, the concepts and suggestions we've heard from our other speakers into real world examples of practical things that people need when they arrive here in the US that just the average person in any congregation or even on the street um, in theory could be of assistance with, with our brothers and sisters of the African diaspora when they arrive here with just basic things like understanding um, the healthcare system, with understanding how to enroll in school, with understanding how to get a job or to start a business, understanding family and cultural dynamics. Those are all practical things that we don't often think about or take for granted. And we genuinely appreciate um, those uh, concrete remarks and suggestions for how we can provide solutions to some of these problems that seem to um, divide us as an African diaspora community. Um, and so now we're going to move to our last four speakers, actually. And they are going to uh, come to us in the following order. Um, next, I introduce Dr. Cotijo Pedro. He's a consecrated pastor uh, by His Holiness, Prophet Simao Goncalves Taco in May 2017. Please forgive my mispronunciation. Uh, and from 2000 to 2005, he served as services director at Angola Offshore Services. From 2012 to 2019, he served as director of the planning and management control office in Sonango MS Telecom. From 2019 to date, he exercises the functions of consultant to that same organization. He currently exercises in the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ in the world, the functions of president of the Simao Concables Taco Foundation and the first deputy to the director of the office for monitoring the plans of ecclesiastical regions. Following Dr. Pedro, we will hear from Advocate Ngubeni. Tabila Ngubeni is a full member of the F.C. James Chapel AME Church of the Bloemfontein Presiding Elder District, Orangia Conference in the 19th Episcopal District, and she is the newly elected lay member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church Judicial Council. At the 2021 General Conference of the AMEC, Ngubeni became the first lay member to be elected to any office by the General Conference of the AMEC. She is now a judge in the Great Zion. Within the Great Zion, Advocate Ngubeni has served as a delegate to the General Conference Lay Organization Biennial, a steward and trustee board member at her local circuit. She has served in the YPD, RYAC, and lay organization at various levels of the connection and specializes in constitutional and administrative law, as well as civil litigation. She is a member of the South African Women's Lawyers Association and as well as the National Democratic Lawyers Association. Following her, we will hear from Ms. Jacqueline DuPont Walker. She is the social director, uh, she is the director of social action for the AME Church writ large. In other words, she is a woman of action who knows how to put 
policy into practice on the ground and mobilize individuals to get to work and to get active in engaging and implementing policy issues and directives. Then finally, to close us out for our speaker portion of our event today, we will hear from none other than Ambassador Edward Soarangera of Malawi. He is the most recent ambassador of Malawi to the United States. And prior to this, he served as the ambassador of Malawi to the Federal Republic of Brazil, during which he facilitated and signed on behalf of his government, the investment cooperation and facilitation agreement between Brazil and Malawi. Ambassador Sawarangera worked as Director General for State Residences, the Chief of Staff. And while at the State House, he established favorable and constructive working relationships with various sections of the presidency, including the State House, the President's Advisory Team, and the Office of the President and the Cabinet. His Excellency presented his letters of credence to the U.S. on September 16, 2016. He is Ambassador Extraordinary and, and uh, Planton Pierre, oh, I can't even pronounce that word, <laughs> of the Republic of, the Mal of Malawi to the United States on a residential basis. Forgive me, Your Excellency. He is also accredited on a non-residential basis to the Bahamas, Canada, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. Ambassador uh, Sawarangera has had a remarkable and distinguished career in the public and private sector in management in Malawi for 20 years. He worked at the Agricultural Development and Marketing Corporation, where he rose through the ranks to the position of Deputy Chief Executive Officer and Head of Operations. And in the past 15 years, he held several executive leadership positions, including Deputy Chief Executive Officer of David Whitehead and Sons, Chief Executive Officer of the National Food Reserve Agency, and Executive Director of Malawi Social Action Fund. So those are our remaining speakers in order following which we will take questions and answer. So, uh, Dr. Pedro, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dr. Pedro, if you can hear me okay, I apologize for interrupting you, Dr. Pedro. We seem to have an unstable connection and we are unable to hear you clearly. We will try to see if we can troubleshoot and um, get a better connection so that we can hear you. And we are going to move on to Advocate Ngubani instead. If we can have our tech team uh, try to troubleshoot. Dr. Pedro, we still uh, have technical difficulties with understanding you. Our technical team will work with you to see if they can figure out what the issue is while we try to move on to Advocate Ngubani. Okay, thank you. Advocate Ngubani, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so very much, Madam Program Director. Um, let me take this opportunity to thank um, the organizers of this great forum for the opportunity to be one of your presenters this afternoon, your time and night, my time. Um, thank you very much. I, this is really a privilege and an honor for me to be able to give you a South African perspective to the topic. Having said that, um, I would like to first spend some time breaking down the, the topic as it was presented. Firstly, by touching briefly on the purpose of faith um, communities and the role they played in um, our past as um, Africa. And that would be, as we all know, um, as a um, support system during our struggle for liberation. Now, when all of the African um, continents obtained or attained liberation politically, it then came to the fore that political emancipation was not true liberation and that when um, the necessity and the need for economic and mental emancipation became um, vivid. And this is when faith communities across um, and outside of Africa then saw it fit that they then should take this up as their next cause. Now, in doing this, um, obviously there had been there have been engagements with other faith communities um, in Africa. Now, engagement denotes that a, a relationship aimed at collaborating towards finding a solution to a problem. Um, in this instance, I'd just like to spend some time discussing um, the concept of, of engagement. Now, when you're engaging someone as a two-way street, it means we are discussing ideas and hopefully mapping the, mess, the best solution to this problem. Now, that process, because we are from different parts of the globe, requires that we appreciate each other's differences. Um, in other words, we are alive to the requirement um, and the need for diversity management. Although we are all black, uh, we are quite diverse in the form of uh, personality, class, education, uh, place of origin and the like. And that uh, places a stumbling block in us trying to engage. Um, and it is important that we are alive to that fact, um, particularly because as we communicate with each other, we miss each other because we, we, we seem to not deal with the elephant in the room, that we are quite diverse. And unless we get to know each other, we will not find each other. Now, once we appreciate that there's diversity between us and the changes may be a stumbling block in us engaging, we then become aware of our respective biases, whether it is that I as an African see you as an American as superior to me because you have better um, access to, to education and, and, and wealth or um, the ability to accrue uh, wealth um, or whether it is that you think because I live in South Africa, I should know someone that lives in Kenya and we all run around with animals all day and therefore we could not be educated. Those slight biases hinder us in our engagement and it's important that once we become aware of them, we address them so that we can find ourselves moving together in the same direction at the same time for a common purpose. Once we have identified the diversity and we have dealt with our biases and are now ready to move forward, obviously there's going to be changes that both parties need to make in their operations with each other and in our engagement with each other. Now this require both parties to engage in what is called change management. We need to change the way we deal with each other because I can't deal with you the way I would deal with an African from Africa. There are certain things and cultural aspects and nuances that we appreciate as Africans that we would have to educate you on. For example, as a young South African woman, I cannot look um, an elderly man in the eye when I speak to him. So that is important. Now, once we have gone through that process of identifying what are the stumbling um, blocks to us engaging, 
we then need to do what is called a needs analysis. What is it that Africa needs from America or anywhere else in, else in the world? And what is the best way of us getting um, the need to fruition? What is it that both parties need to bring to the party? Because I might, I might think this is the best solution, but you having experienced better, you communicating it to me in a way that makes me understand that this is the best solution for the problem will make us get to a solution, a more practical and more pragmatic solution, much faster and with more efficiency. Now, we also need to appreciate our strengths and weaknesses and be able to work with that, separate from diversity and, and, and the like. Now, our, Afri our African-American brothers and sisters are better positioned in, in, with respect to gaining wealth. And it is, it is pivotal and crucial that you use that and ensure that that wealth which you has, have access to for the benefit of Africa is distributed equally in Africa for the benefit of all who are in Africa and ought to benefit from it. It is not only money that we need from you, it is respect, it is the acknowledgement. We need to know that you see us, you hear us, and you understand us so that we can move um, together in finding a solution for Africa and the African diaspora. Now, the, my fellow panelists have um, highlighted a few activities that we can make, we can engage in, and I would not want to labor on that, but the principle should be that we need to be advocates together we need to be solution finders together and those solutions need to be pragmatic and be relevant. We need to be innovative and agile in everything that we do. I thank you. Thank you so much for those words. Um, we're going to go back to um, Dr. Pedro who has rejoined us again and hopefully we will be able to have a better connection. So uh, uh, Dr. Pedro, uh, you have the floor and we're all going to collectively as people of faith pray fervently that we will be able to hear you with no problem. Please come off of mute so that we can try this one more time. I see that you are off mute, so please go ahead. I'm afraid that we still have a problem with uh, connectivity with Dr. Pedro. So we are going to move on with um, the order of speakers that we um, that we have remaining. So, uh, Dr. Harrison, can you please uh, mute your mic and then just unmute really quick? Okay. Very good. Thank you for that. All right, that reset it. Thank you. Thank you. See, this is why we have the technical support team. We appreciate you. As much as many of us have learned about operating uh, and holding meetings in this Zoom space in a year and a half, most of us still are not experts. And so we thank you for having our backs and keeping us going. Uh, so we're going to move right along with our program. Um, I'm not sure if uh, uh, Ms. Jacqueline DuPont Walker is with us. Um, so we are going to move on to the ambassador. Um, Your Excellency, you have the floor and the final word of our initial speaker remarks following which we will open up the floor for Q&A. Those of you who are participating as attendees today, uh, please use the Q&A box in order to enter your questions. That is the most effective and efficient way for us to be able to find your questions in order to present them to our speakers today for discussion. Um, we will try to go through the chat to see if there are any questions or comments there, but the Q&A is the best place for you to raise your questions. And I know we have one person 
who has entered something in the Q&A right now. We will take that question first after we hear from His Excellency. Any others who have questions or comments, please use the Q&A feature. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Lakisha Harrison for actually doing a wonderful job in moderating this discussion. But let me also join those that have spoken before me for thanking the organizers of this uh, uh, discussion um, and for actually include me, including me on the panel. The beauty of being the last person to speak on the panel is that uh, almost everything you wanted to say would have been covered by those that have spoken before you. So indeed, that's what has happened. Now, looking at the uh, subject matter, the topic uh, that is being deliberated, strengthening the engagement between Black faith community and the people of Africa. I want to start my remarks, uh, my concluding remarks by uh, quoting uh, from the Holy Book, the Bible, from the book of Psalms 133, verse one, and uh, I'm quoting from NIV uh, version. And I quote, good, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity and end of quote. When you come together in unity, in community, it is the most amazing, wonderful time of significance you could imagine and realize the best outcome. The principle of coming together benefits everybody. This is the principle that has for a very long time kept the black faith communities together, strong, and with unshakable hope for a better future. Faith guides not only the soul of individuals, but also of the community and the nation. Lack of faith manifests itself through injustices towards others that can come as ra racial injustice, economic injustice, gender-based injustice, amongst others. Churches remain perfect places when I say churches, I also include the infrastructures like mosques and the other temples and whatever. And I, I, I want to say that these remain perfect places to provide forums for such collaboration. Black faith community has been instrumental in securing freedoms for Blacks. The church worked as a safe haven where leaders were groomed for example, Dr. Martin Luther King got his inspiration from the faith he was taught in the Black faith community. His actions provided strength, not only to believers in his church, but the entire Black community. Without faith, the Black community could not have achieved much. First, Faith therefore goes beyond the church. As the church strives to nurture its people, it provides comfort to many people in all aspects of life. This includes healthy education and so social freedoms. Given this foundation, the duty of the faith community in connecting with people of Africa is a big one. The people of Africa have been oppressed economically and socially for a long time, which has affected their freedoms. 
liberating the people economically is the first step to attaining freedoms and enables people to trust in God more. The people of Africa need the help of the entire black faith community in order to experience true freedom. Unity is required to bring out the desired goals. Cultivating trust is another aspect that needs to be worked out on. Trust comes with respect. If people are respected, trust can easily be cultivated. We have a lot of African diaspora in the US who are a good stepping stone in learning how such respect can be earned and trust nurtured. Since the African diaspora are already in contact with the people of Africa, it would be valuable to establish relationships with them. They can provide pro pro proper guidance on how the agenda of strengthening the black faith community and the people of Africa can work. So, in actually wrapping up my discussion, I would like to urge the black faith community here to go beyond church activities. I know that's what they are doing in, in areas where they are actually operating. They must go beyond those activities and reach out with more outreach programs covering the health sector, education sector, agro-processing and the other, you know, agricultural related, you know, activities. And those activities that will empower the people of, of Africa to stand on their own. It is only when you can feed yourself that you can say that you are truly free. Africa needs to feed itself. It has all the resources uh, that can actually make Africa a food basket of the world. But cases of hunger emanating from various you know, causes uh, what is uh, seen in the news media. So that, that area of developing its agriculture potential and ensuring that uh, Africa produces not only enough for itself, but even to feed the world, that's where the faith-based community here should actually look into. The Bible teaches us that faith without works is dead. So we need to have an active faith that should actually come out with the tangible results. I trust and hope that the black faith community will be able to exercise its faith by providing much needed resources and skills for Africa. The youth should be particularly targeted to to impart skills that can make them productive and self-reliant because the youth are the future of any society, any community. With this, what I've said, I think, as I said in my opening remarks, most of the issues that need to be looked at has, have already been in, uh, touched on. But I, once again, I want to thank you know, the organizers and also let you know that uh, uh, my tour of duty ha has come to an end and uh, any time from now I'll be leaving, uh, going back home. I can also be a better link for the, you know, the, the faith-based community here uh, in my home country and I can actually connect the two of us so that uh, we achieve the best. Once again, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for those closing remarks that really pull together the many of the sentiments of our esteemed panelists today. Uh, we have approximately 25 minutes left in our program today, and now we're going to turn to Q&A. In the interest of allowing as much dialogue and discussion as possible, from our attendees who have been waiting patiently to engage with all of you, 
I am going to forego moderator questions and go straight to what it is our participants here are itching to hear you respond to and speak about. So uh, I'm going to take the questions that I see here a little bit out of order because our uh, organizer here of Constituency for Africa has posed a very fundamental question that I think is important to take. And I am going to address it to both of our esteemed ambassadors who are with us today. And then after that, we'll see if any other panelists would like to answer this question that Mel has posed to us. He states that historically, the Black church has been left out of U.S. Africa policy considerations, despite the fact that the Black church represents the largest constituency and, as all of you as our speakers have noted, are doing great work on the continent of Africa, substantive, real transformational work. So the question he poses is, what should be the strategy to change this paradigm in order to increase the engagement of the Black church in formal U.S. policy towards Africa? So ambassadors, whichever one of you would like to go first in order to take that, because as, as ambassadors, you see a much larger global picture about these issues than uh, necessarily the rest of us, but then we will go to other presenters who may have comments as well. So whichever one of our ambassadors would like to start first. And Dr. Harrison, I believe that Ambassador Yansene had to leave us. Oh. So, so therefore it's on to our ambassador, our esteemed ambassador from Malawi. Thank you. Uh, can you come again with the question? I the question, think. yes. The question Mel poses is the fact that the, U, the Black church has historically been left out of official U.S. policy towards Africa. We've been left out of the conversation, even though we're actually doing work on the African continent. And his question is, what should be the strategy to change that so that the Black church can be fold it into the actual policy work of the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, good question, but also very important, uh, looking at what we are discussing uh, today. It is true that uh, what, you, what the, 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 the one who has actually asked this question is saying, uh, my immediate you know, reaction to the question is that uh, for America to come up for, uh, with a, a policy uh, for Africa, it, it requires the African themselves to engage with the administration of uh, US administration, uh, starting from the Congress, uh, Senate, uh, up to the top. In that, in, in, during that engagement, then the, the, the African, uh, they actually present what they think they need. Likewise, uh, it is the, in, in most of the cases, we have a group of, uh, African group of ambassadors in, the, in Washington that actually continuously engage with the uh, US administration. I would suggest that uh, during such, you know, uh, discussions uh, or in the, even in their own right, the, you know, the churches, the black churches can actually uh, get, you know, involved in such discussions. There's within the, you know, the various committees in Congress, there's that, that committee that actually deals with Africa. The, that co committee is very critical. And I would actually propose that uh, uh, the churches here, the black church here in, uh, in the US, should actually start engaging with that subcommittee. And also the church, the black church should also get involved and engage with the African group of ambassadors. Doing that, then there are issues or concerns that can be included. I don't know if I've actually made it, uh, I've tried to respond to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Do we have any other panelists who would like to respond to that question that Mel posed to us? 
I'd like to take a little stab at that, Dr. Harrison. Thank you. I think that uh, number one, many of the predominantly historically black, um, let me do this, uh, many of the historically black denominations do have someone that engages in policy matters or who are, is engaged in social action. For example, the young lady that was not able to be with us today, Jackie DuPont Walker, does a wonderful job in sending out information about policy issues, whether or not it's about voter suppression, whether or not it's about racial intolerance and police brutality. But when I talked with her the other day, historically, even though, for example, our own denomination is the African Methodist Episcopal Church, there's not been much attention uh, paid to issues affecting the people of Africa and policy issues. Yes, Nelson Mandela, free Nelson Mandela around that crisis, and around that icon, we know that. But quite frankly, most black denominations do not spend time encouraging its members. And I guess I'm now shifting to saying, here's what we need to do. And that is to have the bishops of our denominations, uh, my goodness, even uh, independent churches, when they are aware, and the ambassador has made a very good point. There also needs to be a way for there to be some communication that goes on from the African diplomatic corps to perhaps the heads of adjudicatories in the United States, the AME, AME Zion Church, to make us aware of what those issues are. But conversely, to have people from the subcommittee on Africa and the senators and the Congress people that are serving on those committees, respectively, to convey that information to black denominations for us to be able to turn around and get the word out to of the 6,000 churches just within the AME church alone. It could be flooding those Congress people with responses to the African needs. And so I would think that that's one of the mechanisms that we need to do starting today and beyond. Thank you uh, so much for that. Can I yes. add to that too? Yes, Bishop Larte, please. Uh, I think that fundamentally, one of the things that will need to happen will have to be a shifting of the theological understanding. Most black churches have this notion of separation of black of uh, church and state uh, misunderstood. Uh, even the white church, if you go back to look at the moral majority rise in this country, it was because of their fear of communism and, and, and et cetera that shifted their thinking that they needed to get involved. And Ronald Reagan became for them their patron saint. The black church needs to understand that politics is not of the devil and that we need to understand that, that what happens in Washington and other places affects us. And as a result, yes, we have a sister from the AME church, but just imagine if she had the support of the Baptists and the AME Zion, the CME, and all of us working together. So, we need a theological shift of our thinking uh, to let us understand that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we have a responsibility for what happens here on earth and not to abdicate that to just politicians. If I may have a word as well, is that possible? Dr. Yes, Anderson? feel free. Yes, uh, I want to remind us there is the Conference of National Black Churches and that is a place of unity with the ecclesial structures of historic black churches. And they have been very much out front on issues relative to social engagement, uh, global affairs. Uh, certainly much more can be done, but I do wanna remind us that that group does exist at the denominational levels. And I also want to remind us also the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, which also is a lay and clergy movement that is all about public policy and engagement. So what I'm pointing to is there are venues where this is happening. Clearly, much more needs to be done. Clearly, Africa and the Caribbean and other places of African descent need to be more at the center of the ethos and the orientation of any of the groups described 
or other groups that exist. I also want to point out that within the, of course, the 2020 election, we saw a major turning whereby people of African descent really stepped up and used their agency of enfranchisement, uh, which is why we're experiencing so much pushback in this moment relative to voting. So I do see also with the younger generations, certainly with Black Lives Matter and other groups, where there is a huge mobilization even of our young people who are pushing for more of this engagement and setting up their own platforms around these issues. And many of them are our children of faith. So I, you know, I want to be encouraged, but I also want to say, I think there's much more we can do and we need to find where our synergies can align together to do more things in unity. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that answer. Um, we have another question here that I am actually going to pose to um, uh, Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond. Uh, and of course, following her, any of our esteemed panelists can feel free to jump in um, and answer the question as well. But we have a question here about how African Americans are helping to address ethnic conflicts or tensions between various African countries today. And so, um, Pastor White Hammond, since I know you have the history of doing this kind of work in South Sudan, uh, you probably have some lessons learned from that that you can impart upon us today. And then following you, if anyone else would like to address that question, please do. Dr. White Hammond, you have the floor. Sure. Again, I think I've heard this, uh, this subtext even in our conversation is the importance of engaging with uh, with diaspora who are more recent immigrants of, of, of countries and uh, here in, in the United States so that again we're not we're not skipping past the people who are already here to engage with people who are still in Africa and many people who come to this country from uh, from affected countries ha have opinions have ideas and are eager to uh, to 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 look for partners. So uh, that is one of the things that we did, as you suggested, in terms of South Sudan and Sudan, is uh, we very much listened to and uh, uh, members of the diaspora here, whatever policy directions we took, were always informed by what, not only what people there were saying, but what people here were saying. And we often, when we went to the White House or to Congress, we we always went with someone who was a member of the diaspora and they were the ones who actually led the conversation so that we were then reinforcing what they said. In terms of the peace building work, one of the signature aspects of our work was in fact uh, working with women in the diaspora, women who were from Southern Sudan and Northern Sudan and first facilitating the dialogue here in terms of the peace building work. And then subsequently, those were the individuals who with whom we returned to either again in Darfur and, and Northern and Southern Sudan who led the conversations with other women in their countries. Uh, and uh, and uh, that, that we found that to be very effective. So there is a possibility even here to facilitate that dialogue. It is, it's often a challenge, people, um, uh, um, it's often a challenge, but we have found that if we can at least begin the conversation here, support that dialogue here, that people are able to carry that back home. And I will say that one of the things that I'm really proud of is that uh, more recently, I think it was a couple of years ago, Omar Bashir was finally uh, overthrown as the president in Northern Sudan. Uh, many of the women who led the, the fight for getting him out were women that we worked with both in the diaspora and in Sudan. So that those are possibilities as well. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left. Do we have a panelist who would also like to respond to that question? If not, I see at least two more questions to get to in the queue. Okay. All right, so we will move on to the next question. And um, I am going to address this question to Advocate Ngubeni. Uh, because you mentioned uh, issues related to understanding our implicit biases and breaking down cultural barriers. We have a question here about 
uh, the fact that African Americans do not understand African languages and shouldn't churches, black churches in the US promote the idea of learning an African language as part of the process for breaking down these barriers? I think that would, that would be a great idea, but I think there's much more to do than that. I think um, over and above um, um, Americans themselves learning the language, it would be interesting to have the material that we use in different denominations translated in, in, in indigenous languages of Africa or India, wherever the, the church footprint is. Also, what would be important is to ensure that the laws that govern the different um, denominations are alive to the le different legislative and legal systems in, in the countries wherein um, the denominations operate. Because when, when, when you come to Africa and you want to assist, you need to be understanding not only of the people, but of how the people work and the culture and the organizational um, traditions and cultures around the people. So a language is a good place to start, but there's much more that we can do in our respective denominations. And um, even before we move out to assisting the people that are outside the church, our very own members, how do we make sure that they are accommodated? Do we make sure that the policies that the churches themselves have are accommodative before we go out um, to, to assist others that are not even our members? Let's make sure that when we do go out there, our house is in order. And I say this because we now have um, an uncle called Uncle Google. So when you come to Africa and you say, I am the AME church, trust I'm going to Google the AME church and find out how you operate. And if I do not find that in your own organization, in your own church, you are alive to, to the challenges that I have and you are accommodative of me, I'm not going to trust that you are going to, to practice that with me when I'm not even your member. Um, one of the speakers spoke of intentionality and another spoke of trust. Those two aspects are very important in, in what um, we're trying to do here. We need to be intentional and we need to foster trust. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Um, uh, and Dr. Weaver, I just want to bring to your attention that you have a comment in the Q&A that is directed um, specifically to you. So please check out the Q&A for that comment. Um, and then we also have here a, um, a question from Eldridge Gilbert Jr. to um, Ambassador Sarawar Nguera. And he would like to know if you could share the history of the Tridzulu uh, Baptist Mission and its founder, the late Reverend John Chelimwe. Uh, you're on mute, sir. You are you're on mute. There we go. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the name Jesus. Can you spell the, the word? Because uh, yes, as it's spelled in the question, it is C H R I D Z U L U. Sri Zulu Baptist Mission and the founder Reverend John. Oh, Chirazulu. Chirazulu. Oh, Tri Ch okay, all right. Thank you. Yes. Okay, yeah. So, and the, 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 the before uh, continue with that question. What is the question now? What Just can you share the history of, uh, of it and the founder? All right, thank you so much. Actually, this is uh, what we call PIM mission, Providence Industrial Mission in Chirazulu District which was actually formed by uh, Reverend John Chilembe, who was the first freedom fighter for Nyasaland, then Malawi, then before it became Malawi, uh, to fight for the freedom of the people. Chilembe came to US uh, to study at uh, uh, African Baptist, you know, a church, I think, in Virginia. Uh, where he actually graduated with a theology certificate and went back and started uh, a Providence Industrial Mission, which actually was not only handling the 
a spiritual aspect, but also it introduced, you know, uh, um, vocational training school where people were trained in uh, farming as well as the artisan work like bricklaying, carpentry, and what have you. It was a very uh, big achievement for a black man and was supported by black uh, uh, faith, you know, groups from this. They actually pull, pulled a lot of money and built a very, you know, big church. But during that time, it, Mal Malawi was under the colonial rule and uh, there were uh, whites who were actually also doing agriculture in Malawi uh, who were not happy to see what John Chilem was doing. As a result, they tried to actually uh, to, uh, to, to make him fail to the extent that Chilem was not happy. And the church actually started growing at the time when the First World War uh, began. So during that time, one of the issues that also annoyed the whites as well as the colonial you know, uh, administrators was that Chilembe wrote a letter to the governor general in Zomba, which was published in the dailies of that time, Nyasaland Times. He, it was a question which he asked the, the governors uh, of that time that, okay, there's this world war, which is the fighting between the you know, Europeans. And we are being asked as blacks to actually join the fight. Can we be told after the war, what would be the benefit of you know, uh, the blacks? Actually, Chilembe was, was, was trying to actually uh, ask the, you know, the, 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 the governors uh, to, to make sure that, you know, whatever decisions they are making, they should not exclude the, the indigenous, you know, Nyasaland people then, Malawi and then, uh, in whatever decision. So as a result of that, there was an uprising and the Chilembe uh, uh, was killed. But the church still continued because uh, the Baptist Convention here in the US, the African Baptist Convention sent uh, missionaries, black missionaries to Malawi to, to continue from where John Islam stopped. As I'm talking now, uh, the church is very is thriving very well. It has got uh, schools, but also it has actually moved into Mozambique. They have got a lot of you know missions in Mozambique where they are also evangelizing, and it, it covers the whole country of Malawi. Possibly that's what I would say about the uh, Providence Industrial Mission by uh, Reverend John Chilembe in Shirazumo. Thank you. Thank you for that history, Ambassador. Um, I think we all learned a, a little bit more than we knew before. And thank you for posing that question, Mr. Gilbert. And um, since Dr. Pedro was unable to speak to us on his own here due to some connectivity challenges, he has taken advantage of uh, other technical ways to communicate to us. So we're going to close the panelist portion here with his comments. Um, and in the words of Dr. Pedro, he says, I think Black U.S. churches in Africa they strengthen relationships in different perspectives. For example, development of exchange cultural programs. Two, development of rural communities specific programs to help provide skills to improve forming technical and uh, animal creation and knowledge. Number three, develop programs to approach African business people and US African uh, and US business people in order to bridge uh, relationships and opportunities between both sides. And finally, number four, develop specific programs for training young people in order to train them in some technical areas like computer repair, electrical installation, etc. And I think that's a very salient point because so often we emphasize um, uh, college education, but 
in addition to college education, we have vocational training that is still very, very critical, just as valid, just as needed, and just as respected. So thank you for those four points, uh, Dr. Pedro. Now I will turn it back over to Dr. Weaver as I say thank you again for this opportunity to serve as moderator for this esteemed panel. You assembled an, ex an esteemed group of panelists to speak here. I think we have all learned tremendously from each other. I can speak for myself and say that I learned a great deal from all of you. And thank you for this opportunity and all of your hard work in gathering us together in this space for our own, uh, I guess, faith-based palaver this afternoon. So back to you, Dr. Weaver, in order to close us out. Dr. Harrison, thank you so much. You have performed extraordinary uh, ways this afternoon, and we're very grateful for what you've done. Uh, Mel, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment, but just to let you know that, Mel, we had quite a number of countries represented here this afternoon, Rwanda, Angola, uh, my goodness, South Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Reverend Gloria um, Hammond there in Iceland temporarily. So, we, so we're very, very grateful. Let me just say that uh, this was intended to be an action-oriented session, and it was. My desire is for anybody that so desires is to join us every third Saturday for the Pan-African Collective when we have a series of discussions each month. We want to be able to take these ideas and suggestions and to work with people very closely like Mel Foote and the Constituency for Africa, because we could do so much more collectively than we could ever do individually. And so again, to you, Dr. Harrison, and to all of the panelists, thank you so much. Mel Foote, this is really your baby for years through the a series named after Ronald H. Brown. And so I want to turn it over to you for closing remarks and to again say thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Reverend Weaver. Uh, thank you, Reverend Harrison, uh, Bishop Larty. Um, this has been uh, enlightening. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for this conversation. And, um, you know, this is, this is the concluding activity of the CFA 2021 Ronald H. Brown African Affairs Series. And uh, certainly it has been the most impactful series ever yet. And uh, it, it surprises me because we're operating in a COVID-19 environment, but yet uh, somehow we're having more impact than we've ever had. Um, I have uh, a few things. You know, what I've always uh, uh, thought about the black church. I always thought about uh, how they could impact uh, greater in, in Africa. And um, so there's a few things that I, I just want to throw on the table. First, I want to say hello to my friend Angelica Walker. You know, we've uh, seen each other for many years, but we've never sat down and talked. And you know, let's make that happen. You know, <laughs> we need to do that. And uh, uh, I, I apologize for my part. I'm always going and I'm walking past people as opposed to stopping and talking to people. I look um, forward to it now. It'll be a joy. Let's make that happen. Um, okay. Uh, the impact side. Uh, today we had a meeting with uh, Jessica Davis uh, Ba, who is a good friend of mine, who happened to be the director for Africa, really, for Vice President Kamala Harris. And um, uh, she, uh, the Africa policy for the Biden-Harris administration will be handled by the Vice President. And so the meeting today um, was to have some impact on the policy which will be released uh, before the end of the year. And we were going to do this meeting in November, and I was told, no, move it up. So we moved it up part of the series. But we also included uh, Reverend Harrison and Reverend Weaver uh, intentionally to be part of that. And uh, we had several representatives from uh, uh, our different forums that would take place this past week. Uh, we also had, it was 40 people who were invited. And uh, I can say that uh, uh, all 40 really brought uh, thunder from uh, across sections. And so we were very pleased. But I thought it gave, uh, uh, we, I asked Reverend Weaver to specifically ask a question, given the fact that faith-based organizations are generally the first one to respond to crisis in Africa. They're the first one to provide food, uh, respond to the volcano in the Congo. 
uh, family relief, whatever it is, you know the first ones going to step up are going to be the black church. But uh, I can say that, uh, you know, I, I spent all of my time around the, the policy environment uh, related to Africa. And I know they haven't called on the black church to see what you think. And so that's why I posed the question. Um, there are a lot of things that need to happen. Uh, one, the, the black church need to be responsive to the political environment. I mean, Washington is a political uh, city. And so what does that mean? That means write op-eds, you know, say something, you know. The U.S. need to step up engagement in Haiti. The U.S. need to do something. They read that, you know, they read that. And um, uh, so I think an organization like CFA uh, could be a great partner. I know Bishop Larty and I are talking. We've been talking for the past six months or a year. And we've been talking. I've been involved in several hit forums. I've been involved in uh, 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 Reverend Harrison's uh, uh, forum. Uh, they had a wonderful forum at Juneteenth. <laughs> And I was a, a participant in that. And so, you know, we started to, and, I, and I, I, after a meeting with Reverend Harrison, I never met her personally. I feel like she's my best friend, but uh, we never met. We never shook hands. We never, you know, had coffee. But I, I said, okay, Reverend Weaver, who is one of my best friends, I said, you guys got to meet. And I hooked them up virtually. This technology is good. I hooked them up virtually so that they can meet. And now, oof, they're connected. You know, the Reverend called me and said, I like that woman. You know, she's very, and, uh, and, and, and so now I'm, I'm very happy that they're partners. You know, I don't care where it go. It can't go, but, it play, but good places, it can't. Um, so I think they're the, a, a tad bit of organizing. Now, CFA is a real small organization, always has been. Why is that? The white man don't want me to have money. You know, if, if I had money, what could I do? I'm building a constituency to support Africa led by black people. <laughs> I'm not apologizing for that. And so when it comes to the foundations, when it comes to the corporations, when it comes to the US government, well, I don't know, we can fund you. They do all kinds of my ideals, get, you know, take the, the Young African Leaders Initiative. I gave it to Obama, I wrote the paper for it. The first year they flew me around Africa. The next year they pushed me away. Now they don't even mention my name. I don't get invited to the meeting even. You know, they make it sound mm -hmm. like, oh, this is something that Obama came up with while he was sleeping. Um, and that's okay with me, you know? Uh, I don't care who gets the credit, you know? Uh, I really don't. Um, some of the things I was thinking about, an annual town meeting on Africa should be held in every church, you know? Uh, annual town meeting in Africa. You can invite an ambassador. If you do it virtually, you certainly can engage the African diplomatic corps uh, fully, you know? But this is about linkages and, and education. Um, I think you got to encourage young people in these churches to join organizations like the Peace Corps. We had one session on the Peace Corps. Peace Corps, I'm a Peace Corps volunteer. That's how I got it started. You know, but if you look at the Peace Corps, maybe 2% of the volunteers are black. Why is that? They don't want us to, in the Peace Corps. They, they don't want us to, because most of the Peace Corps volunteers end up ambassadors. They end up with USAID, State Department. Uh, do they want blacks to end up in State Department, USAID, and ambassadors? No. You know, so let's don't fool ourselves on that. Um, so I think that, you know, we ought to take over the Peace Corps. That's what I think. And I think the black churches could be very instrumental in educating young people in, in your congregations about it. Um, I think you got to support organizations like CFA. You know, now I'm getting up age. I don't know how much longer I can do this. People don't believe it, but I'm 70 years old. Although I did four miles today, Reverend. I did four miles. Uh, yeah, I try to do what I can to stay young. But um, uh, CFA needs to be supported by independent sources, you know, that uh, they don't control, that you control. And I say that in the sense that in addition to supporting CFA, demand that we work with you. And I am. Anytime Reverend Weaver call me, the answer is yes. He don't even have to get it out of his mouth. Yes. Yes, Reverend. All I need to know is what day, what time, what you want me to do. That's it. Uh, now, Reverend Harrison, you got the same... You got the same priority. Anything you want me to do, just call me. You know, I, I'm, I'm there for you. Um, so not only do you support this organization, but you run the organization. You, you want to put somebody on my board of directors? Hey, Bishop Larkin would be great, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, take these organizations over and make sure they help engage you. I mean, what I do, people think it's magic. It's not magic. I just have a network within these policy apparatus that is, is there. It can be used. 
and I want you to use it. You know, I'm doing it. Today, I had brought everybody to this meeting. It was the happiest meeting I could say I had. All the ambassadors are going to want to know what went on in that meeting today. Now, I am going to have a tape, and I'm going to try to figure out how I can just send it to all the ambassadors. I want you to know what we, you know, we've discussed the U.S. policy toward Africa in the Biden administration going forward. And so you need to know what we discussed, right? Um, and I would say, uh, uh, you know, you should also raise the issues of Africa with members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Just because they're Black don't mean that they have an Africa agenda. It doesn't, you know. Uh, members of the Black Caucus, their primary, uh, the primary mission is to get, like any other member of Congress, the primary mission is to get reelected, you know. It's not about... Let me go and solve the problems in Africa. It's about getting reelected. So you actually got to make it. You know, you one, you get, you, you win the friendship of the of, of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, like Karen Bass. She's one of my best friends. You know, why is that? James Clyburn, one of my best friends. Why is that? You know, because I'm looking at it and say, gee, well, that's the person I need to be close to. So you got to get close to them too. And one way of doing it is support them when you can, but also engage them, call them, write them. You know, have your congregation, the 6,000 letters to a member of Congress, I think is exciting. You know, we talk about that kind of potential, but we ought to make it happen. Find the issue and just decide one day we want the U.S. government to change something and then just get all your congregations to write that letter and make a call, put a couple of op-eds into the Washington Post and in the black newspaper, done. You would be surprised how quickly the policy changes. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for a stimulating conversation. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, CFA is not going to start a, a faith-based policy roundtable or nothing like that. I want to work with the Pan-African Collective or an already existing infrastructure. You know, we don't need to compete or anything. I'm ready to work with the infrastructure of the Black Church um, in any way you all decide best to move forward. So I just think that um, we ought to take this conversation today and uh, figure out what the strategy and uh, put it down on paper. You know, I think Dr. Harrison is a, she's a PhD, by the way, Howard University, you know, they know how to write at Howard, you know. So let's put that writing to test. Let's t put that, <laughs> and they got money too. Howard is just loaded with money. I heard they're just giving it away by the boatload. So maybe we ought to try to uh, get the uh, Theological Institute at Howard uh, to take a leadership role uh, in uh, mobilizing uh, the faith-based community in support of Africa. So I just want to say thank you all, Reverend Weaver, Reverend Harrison, Reverend Larty. Thank you very much for uh, convening this conversation. And uh, this concludes uh, the, the 2021 Ronald H. Brown African Affairs Series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you so much. Uh, is he requesting a comment? Is he asking a comment? Will he entertain any comment? Sure, sure. Uh, what I'd like to suggest, sir, is that between you and Dr. Weaver, to find a way to provide training for preachers. A lot of what you talked about, I'm so delighted to let you know that preachers would do it if they knew how to. So I think with your knowledge and contact, that of Dr. Weaver and contact, think about an opportunity to, even maybe with the Proctor Institute, but let's find a way to be able to educate and train ministers and even lay people on how to constructively, intentionally participate in governmental policy making issues. Great idea. Reverend Will caucus on that and a uh, great idea. Yep, yes. I, I concur, Bishop and Mel. So we can definitely talk about that, absolutely. Excellent idea. I, I can say it, considering the things that I have studied um, and um, working on African studies and religion, there is no such thing. Uh, so this was a perfect opportunity to, to do that and take that to another level. 
And I think there's also a thirst on behalf of um, Black pastors in the Black American church to do so, but they have no idea where to go or how to do because they don't necessarily want to go back to school and study it if they didn't go to someplace like Howard or a Black-centered school of theology, if they went to a predominantly white or otherwise uh, school of theology where African-centered approaches to theology were not the core of the curriculum, they don't even know where to start. Well, let's explore that. I mean, that's a doable kind of a task. Uh, I think we ought to, uh, we ought to do that. Uh, I got some ideas already percolating. So uh, we'll have a conversation, uh, the three of us maybe, to start uh, this, 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 this ball, you know. You know, we can do this, yeah, absolutely. And with technology, why not, you know? We can do it virtually, we can, you know, we, we, we can do this. This is absolutely. not rocket science anymore. You can get a 10 year old can put a Zoom together. <laughs> Well, might I note that there, there are several networks and denominational groups that are doing public policy mobilization. Uh, so I just want to name that you can build it from scratch if you want to, uh, but you don't have to build it from scratch if you don't want to. Uh, and it might be worth uh, while uh, discovering, it's not that many of them of the national ones, but several of them already are doing some public, public policy advocacy work and they mobilize key leaders to have like a, a DC day and, and uh, they gather uh, to, to coach people up uh, that's not the full complement of it, uh, but I just wanted to note that there's some pieces of a puzzle that are already there, and then there's some others who have done some training around how to uh, define a, public, a policy position, determine which committees it comes out of, count your votes already, figure out who's on the fence, so I just wanted to note that some of that has happened and it would be worth knowing about so that whatever is available, uh, you could draw on. Thanks. Uh, uh, Reverend Goatley, uh, we met a, a zillion years ago. I was a young guy and you were the young guy. And yeah, think, you, were, you were doing eight miles a day then instead of four. <laughs> I think Reverend Sam Nixon might have uh, did some things with Lock mm -hmm. Carey. Um, That's correct. But I, I would say that uh, uh, I've seen it on the, on the domestic policy front. I've seen a lot on voter registration. I've seen it on domestic, but I have not seen it on Africa policy. Now that might be where, uh, you know, uh, the, the conversation might go. And I know that, um, uh, so I, I, I think we, we absolutely need to have some intelligence about what, what exists. And, uh, and Mel, if I could just- Or not recreating the will, if you can help. But uh, I Mel, I think that if you can get 40 pastors who are thinking like-minded on this, not a thousand, yeah, not 5,000, 40. I like the number 40. Uh, that a good cross-section, women, men, uh, different parts of the country to agree on an Africa strategy. Now we aren't just talking about uh, the flag, red, black, and green. I could bring Jesus Garvey to talk anytime. Jesus is my best friend, but, um, when I, when I get a sense that we get emotional about stuff, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, sure, we'll get emotional about it, but some of the stuff that we need to be practical about by pushing our government to do some things, uh, they're not feeling us. You know, they don't have any kind of, a, so uh, I, you know, I think we ought to explore, you, you definitely need to be on this committee. And Mel, can I add just one other comment uh, in light of what Bishop Larte was saying earlier? I think that there are some denominations that have a training process by which persons ultimately become ordained. But unfortunately, I don't know of any denomination that has as a part of its training for people to be ordained, any element that really focuses on having global thinking and to think that, uh, internationally uh, in, in their ministry. So I think if we can begin to inculcate something 
uh, from a global perspective and specifically about Africa to those persons that aspire to become deacons and elders within the Methodist tradition while they're in training. And in fact, Bishop Lardy, I think even mandating that before somebody is ordained, that they take at least one trip to Africa <laughs> before they become a pastor. So I, I concur, Mel, and I think that if we can come together at some point after this, it would be great. I want to also suggest that there are people out there like uh, Reverend Skip Gilbert, uh, who raised a question. Uh, Skip is from my hometown, uh, Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> and uh, his father was the, the, the number one uh, black church leader in Rockford uh, growing up, you know. So Skip grew out of the church. But also I have friends, I introduced you to Forrest uh, Branch, who's in Namibia right now. Forrest is very faith-based driven. There's a lot of people who uh, even from the United States who are in Africa, who really do uh, get it and appreciate it, but they need to be connected to a, sort of a, a strategy, uh, you know, else they're, they're operating independently out there. They know it. They, they understand what need, they understand all the linkages. Uh, the sister from South Africa, the Tabili, uh, wow, you know, she's awesome, you know. Uh, yeah, it just seemed to me that uh, we heard a lot of it here today. And uh, the question is, how do we uh, pull it together? One, to shape policy. Uh, secondly, to increase partnerships and support, you know, understanding. Um, I, I'm trying to stay away from the theological arguments because I don't want uh, the AME to fight the Baptists or the CME to, none of that, you know. We got to stay away from who's God or whatever. But I think we can we can agree on our Afrocentric, our <laughs> Bishop, help me out on that. <laughs> uh, you know, we can agree on our, our Africanness, and uh, that, that's really where I would like for us to have some impact. And a lot of people pray for wh however they want to pray. If you want to be a, a Islam, a Muslim is your faith, so be it. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to get into that debate, but I think there we can do some things to, um, because right now we're being played against each other. We, we're being you know, fragmented, you know, so we don't have the impact that we, you know, really, if other organizations and institutions did as much as the Black church has done on all of these issues, boy, they will be having a, a front row center uh, seat at the State of the Union address, you know, but because we're fragmented, uh, you know, the impact is not necessarily seen or heard or felt in the policy environment. I want to thank everybody again, but I'm going to have to press on. Uh, yeah. Bishop, Dr. Harrison, Mel, my good brother, uh, Goatley, and anybody else that's still on the line, thank you. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to keep this action oriented. Let's try to get a, a, a get together, say, say within two weeks, you know, sure. uh, at least the three or four of us, let's get together and have a, 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 a conversation. Let's, uh, let's let it digest a bit and come together in a, in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Dr. Weaver. Dr. Weber, yes, sir, Bishop. Please, before you, you close it out, please, as you all meet, let's add the fact of how we translate the idea of the town hall meeting into action, because I think that too is a very powerful way by which we can bring the connection and engagement. Absolutely. And I would add one other thing as a part of just unifying us, Mel, to your point, whether we are Baptist, AME Zion, or indeed a Muslim, I think that perhaps having an African Sunday or an African day where indeed we are truly coming together unified, whether or not we are in uh, Luanda, Angola or in Alabama, that we can indeed come together as a body uh, so that we can say we're unified because of our heritage, our history, our ancestry, uh, and have us to think about, and then begin to think about developing some other strategies so that we can remain connected. I see. I see. Well, thank you all. Bless you. Thank you all. Thank you. Good afternoon and good night. Um, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>